Erickson and the holographic theory of mind. Continuing in part 66. Color, the inverse problem, Bayes, or the Bayesian approach. Some questions, is color only in the mind as opposed to in the external material field? Bayes, as a solution to the inverse problem, the rise of natural scene statistics, looking at things in natural scenes, and then back to Gibson and to Bergson. So currently, in perception and consciousness, there's a couple of favorite themes. The first is color does not exist in the material world. Color is rather only in the mind, in some mental space. And secondly, there is an inverse problem, and it's all solved by a Bayesian or probabilistic approach, because the retinal information, light information in the retina is so ambiguous, so vague in structure, the external world has to be guessed. An example, the inverse problem with respect to motion. Felix is walking there. Well, as Felix path projects on the eye, it would project as such and at, at the back of the retina. However, a different length, different velocity would project exactly the same, or yet another one. So different velocities and distances project as the same as the retina. So how do we disambiguate, so to speak, what the actual velocity and distances are? Or here we're seeing domes, but if we simply invert, oh, they're holes. So what's the real perception? What's the real case? So this is in support of a Kantian constructivist conception. That is, the brain is constructing the percept, putting it together. This is furthered by Helmholtz that all perception is an inference or inferring what the percept is from partial or ambiguous information arriving at the eyes, and refined further in predictive processing, that framework, for example, by Carl Friston and others. For example, this is all occurring while minimizing free energy in this free energy principle. The Bergson Gibson probability prior, if we stay in the Bayesian framework on all this, is pretty low. So why do we see in just the one way as hemispheres or domes? And let me note for the next several slides on the Bayesian machinery, I'll be kind of following this little paper by Orlandi, Bayesian perception is ecological perception, down there at the bottom right. So presume two hypotheses. Hypothesis S is that we've got spheres or hemispheres. And hypothesis C, well, we've got domes. One says we're illumined from above, S. C says it's illumined from below. And we're dragging these out of a cloud, shall we say, a space of prior assumptions. We'll look at that more. So S is given the higher probability, domes. Why? Because vision assumes light from a single source and from above namely the sun. So we're going to check the hypothesis S against the evidence. So we'll assume S generates a kind of mock stimulus, a perception, a hypothesized perception. And then we're going to match. So we'll match the actual information to the mock stimulus. And if a mismatch, we'll generate an error signal. However, if there's no error, well, ultimately, we're going to accept that hypothesis. We're going to confirm it. Now, given prior knowledge of the environment, that is the form of a simulation that S would produce on the retina, a likelihood be, can be calculated. So up on the right there, we're looking at Bayes' formula, probability of A given B, or in this case, S given C, uh, and there's a little formula there. And so we're computing the likelihood, probability of uh, B given A, et cetera. 
And we can calculate the posterior probability, which is a product of the likelihood and the probability in this case of S, hypothesis S. And since we got no air above, so we'll select S as a percept because it's probable. So S percept is domes, and therefore we have a nice explanation. So confirm. We'll confirm that hypothesis. If air, however, or what's called surprisal, we didn't expect that, doesn't match hypothesis, well, we're going to have to adjust the percept somehow. So implicit knowledge is essential here. That cloud of priors and hyper priors, hypers being very general things like the light is from above. The uh, sensory evidence is compatible with both hypothesis S and C. And the likelihoods of S and C are both equal. So the prior assigns higher prior probability to S, the light from above. So S gets the higher posterior. Again, back to Bayes' formula over there. So explanation, the power of explanation is loaded on the priors. So much so that incoming input is only seen as producing error or not. And as you remember, in, if you saw number 14, where we discussed this, actually the predictive hypothesis, Howey, for example, would argue that the input, the information is actually suppressed in favor of the predicted hypothesis. In fact, if there's a nice perfect match, we see the predicted hypothesis somehow. Now, predictive processing, why it's called that, it's, it's actually from a computer framework, data compression strategy, which keys on efficient information transmission by sending only information that is not expected. So it cuts down the amount of information. But again, how is that space of possible priors constrained? Because that's where all explanation is loaded. There's an enormous number of possible cups of coffee, for example, that we'd have to, one of which we have to pick. And of course, we can imagine situations where we walk into a restaurant where we've never seen such a cup of coffee before. There's far more also in a landscape than two hypotheses, either spears or holes. Obviously, there's way more going on than these nice two possible hypotheses spears or holes. How would the system know there are only spears or holes, or hemispheres, domes? This is a mystery. How it knows these hypotheses is, is equally as bad as the original mystery, that is, as the inverse problem. Now, priors can concern color horizontal components in an image, edges, velocities, shades. A prior about horizontal structure doesn't help much here, talking domes and spears. A hyper prior, like light comes from above, is way too general, it applies to all kinds of other things, objects in those environments. So how to constrain to the relevant priors like S or C? Well, the best answer, via the information coming from the bottom, that is from the environment itself. This would constrain the priors, but it would also make the Bayesian framework irrelevant and it's gone. The driving signal does not just reduce the hypothesis space, it specifies a convex sphere, that is one hypothesis, just one. Its statistical properties imply that we're first going to see things as a sphere, rotate the situation, the statistical properties change. There's a new hypothesis, holes, that is a new specification. Vision sees half spheres because it is exposed to them, not because it is making inferences. 
So we've come to Gibson. Gibson had long argued that the information for perception is far richer than presumed by the inverse problem. Illusions, he argued, are a function of artificial information deprived arrangements where natural information normally in the environment has been destroyed. For example, the Ponzo illusion, the two blocks on the road there. Now the two blocks are actually the same length. That little blue line there is actually the same length. It never changes, so it kind of changes perceptually even as it moves. But naturally, on the environment's texture gradient, they would look the way they appear there. Again, we have the texture gradient, rows of texture elements that that little picture of the road and the sun would look like. If we move the cup forward across the gradient, well, we're maintaining a ratio. The ratio of height s to texture rho is occluded in. That's a constant, an invariant, thus size constancy. Four rows occluded in the back there, that's just two rows occluded in the front. Meanwhile, the height doubles. Move the cup back without respecting this natural ratio. And it's going to look like, well, the Ponzo illusion. Or here's another one, the Pogendorf illusion. The two lines look bent, but in reality, they're not. But on B there, we have a natural 3D configuration in which such lines would be found. So implied in this already, this is a statistical argument. There will be invariants in natural scenes that are statistical regularities as in the Pogendorf. Now, we're going to see a little conflict here because Bergson is invoking these invariance laws, but also this does not ex exclude statistical invariants. And some of the st statistical invariants can as well be invariance laws. In a natural environment, the stimulus information is highly constraining, limiting things to just one quote, hypothesis. Now, it took a while, but natural scene statistics came on the scene. And natural scene statistics researchers began to look at statistical properties in the external environment, measuring properties in large numbers of natural scenes. Yang and Purvis, for example, luminance. Geisler, edge elements. An example from Purvis and Lato in 2003, where we see what we do. This is a heavy, uh, impactful book. Here we have look, looking at luminance. So we have the two uh, dots there. Luminance is an increase in the number of photons striking the eye. But brightness is rather famously not a direct function of luminance. In actuality, the two circles there are equiluminant, they're equiluminant circles. Yet, the one on the right appears darker. Why is the right circle appearing darker? Well, we look at a natural scene. So there's two possible sources of the brightness contrast effect we we're just talking about. The right scene is in our environment, a normal environment, the statistically more common cause of the stimulus. Why? Because high luminance surrounds co-occur more frequently, statistically, with high luminance targets than with low luminance targets. This means that the stimuli are more likely caused by the scene on the right. They are more likely caused by targets that are both illuminated differently and have different reflective pro reflectance properties. A statistical law, shall we say. There's no appeal to inference here. Rather, we're appealing to the statistically usual causes of a scene. If the stimulus is normally produced by things of a different brightness, we're likely to see them as such. We explain the inverse problem then by appeal to how the world is. Another example. In this case, the variable is intensity or luminance. 
intensity or luminance difference. And uh, on A, the left side, you have spectral returns of the central squares, the two squares circled on each face. Um, they're identical, but they're seen as different. Now, this is a contrast effect. If we look at the inset, the box A, color contrast effect, where the front face and the top face are similarly reflective surfaces, but they're presented in the context that differs in intensity. On side A, the yellow tile is brown in a neutral context, like a circle on the bottom there, but it's seen as yellow in this particular uh, reflective um, surfaces under different luminance. So the probability of this is that it originates from differently reflective surfaces under different luminance, and so we're seeing that yellow tile in the front face as yellow rather than brown. And then on B, and I apologize, I couldn't quite, I couldn't find the an actual picture from the book on, on the internet. So this is a sort of a kludge, but uh, that B should be a little bit less bright. And I've sort of filled in the colors, but here you have a constancy effect because the front face the yellow is again brown in a neutral context, but now it's seen as yellow as opposed to the, the brown on the top face. So now we have a contrast effect, but again, the information is consistent in this case with spectral returns arising from a similarly reflective surface under different illuminates. Here's another case, same objects as we've just seen, but now you have a yellowish illuminated scene or a blue illuminated scene. Now the blue tiles on the top of the cube in, uh, in A and the yellow tiles on the top of the cube in B, in this case, are identical. The blue tiles there are, and either, either block are gray. They're sort of the gray tiles and yet in different contexts, they're seen either as blue or yellow. Um, and uh, and again, they will appear as gray when uh, or middle gray when placed on against the neutral background. So here we have this contrast effect, whereas the, the squares seen as red uh, are actually the color being shown that yellow are on the kind of magenta, but now they're seen as red. In, uh, in this context. So there's a constancy effect. You're both seen as red. So exactly the same context creates contrast or constancy. And as Purvis and Lotto say, this is a result that is difficult to explain other than by visual circuitry that is linked images and behaviors, that is action. So when they say images, they're always talking about the retinal image. And they're arguing that the perception is actually created by successful actions relative to different objects in different colors in the experience. So by virtue of experience and determines what we see. Interestingly, they just is to note the curious implication of right? Bergson's perception as virtual action here, because basically they're saying you're even seeing color with respect to the capability of action or how, how one can act. They make a note of, of a related phenomenon, the organization of the visual, of the human visual color space around four unique hues, red, green, blue, and yellow. Now there's no basis in the spectra, nor, nor is this predicted by the three cone types in the retina. It's a mystery. And yet it seems oriented to action too, the visual system solution to the four color map problem, which one can look up. For you need four colors to uh, uniquely identify objects to act upon. In the map case, you need four colors so that all the states say in a, in a United States map are different colors. If you don't have two colors next, two states next to each other, they're both red, for example. In the action case, you would look at it this way. Here's 
a collection of objects, how would you color that collection of objects so no unique object is lost? You need four colors. Here's a three color try, and it doesn't work so well because some of the objects have been sort of merged together. Here in the four color case, all the all the objects are remain the same. And again, this would be quite useful in an actual environment, such as our jungle there, where you're, you need to see all these separate objects, maybe to find mushrooms to eat or yams or something. Gray, seen as either blue or yellow. Perhaps the quintessence of what drives theorists into a, at least an implicit idealism. To quote Purvis and Lotto, what we see is not a simulacrum of the physical world, but a subjective universe in which perceptions are predicted by the history of experience. To quote David Briggs, the dimensions of color. In the modern theory of color vision, all colors are created by the brain, all in exactly the same way as combinations of yellow, blue, and red, green color opponent signals in the retina based indirectly on unequal responses of the cone cells regardless of whether the stimulus is a single wavelength or a mixture. So whether we're talking red, green, or magenta, some mixture, it's all done the same way. None apparently is a function of its unique color. So it's near universal. The brain creates color. Color is in the mind, in some perceptual space, a mental space. But we end in a mystery never to be solved. Why? Driving this entire conception, color is only in the mind or mental space, is a classic metaphysic of space and time. In this framework, all quality has been stripped for the material field. Thus, no colored vibrations in the material field, for example. The difficulty, the brain is equally intricately embedded in this classic quality-less stripped conceptual framework. As such, the brain too is helpless in, logically precluded from, creating any quality. This includes qualities of motion. Remember Valerie Hardcastle's description of qualia, the patrons shifting in their seats, the musicians concentrating, the curtains gently and ever so slightly waving. So no quality, any quality of motion, that's been stripped, gently waving curtains, roses opening, qualities of the scale of time, buzzing flies, hair and light flies. This entirety has to be precluded. But color comes from somewhere. But there's no room for a mind, for the mental space, for the perceptual space, in the classic metaphysic, save totally incongruently and, and actually inconsistently when AI. You'll have people like Yosha Bach, an AI enthusiast, saying things happen in the mental space, the perceptual space, but there can't be a mental space or a perceptual space in AI, which is the quintessence, the embodiment the expression logically of the classic metaphysic. So it's not possible. So we either end in this complete mystery or we accept that color is a property of the universal field and that the brain is not magically creating it, specifying it for the sake of, for the sake of action, specifying color, employing memory, so that's experience, projecting memory states of the uh, material field. Yes. Creating? No. We'll come back to this, but, but we have to go on to Bayes. Now, one might argue that Bayesian machinery is still needed, that Bayesian models describe the kinds of neural structures brains grow as they interact with natural scenes. This is possibly the case, but the difficulty is way worse, as we shall see. For certain, any keeping of Bayesian machinery is still not rescuing Kantian constructivism or Helmholtzian inference. Why? Because nothing in this account, nothing in the above, in Bayes, 
the Bayesian accounts, account for the origin of the image of the external world. It's just a mathematical machinery. This is already just a category error. As we saw Stephen Meyer term theories with the material universe emerging simply from the equations, like Platonic equations, like uh, Stephen Hawking there, where it emerges, the material universe emerges because a law exists, such as gravity. So we have the material universe, the uh, universe, of, universe of perception emerging from Bayesian statistics. But statistical invariance is not the only kind of invariance, not the dynamic invariance defined over the flow of time. And Bayes, a discrete state process, quote unquote, cannot handle this. As we saw, intrinsic to the Bayesian machinery is an ill-defined matching process. We have the prediction, the downward flow, compared against the input, the upward, upward flow. And as we so I've stated the uh, prediction actually wins if there's a match. The downward flow wins, suppresses the input. So at, this is a comparator at its base, where we have a comparator of the external world. I've noted several times this is a la la land. It's based in static scenes, on static frame after static frame. The event literally has to be stopped frame after frame after frame, somehow synced. It studiously ignores the reality of, of the structure of Gibson's events. Now, this too is a natural scene, the coffee stirring, with that invariant structure, velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios. It is a ratio over time of energy of oscillation to frequency of oscillation, inertial tensors, various momenta, acoustical invariance, all that. So when we look at the comparator, what do we see? We're taking a snapshot of that event take our snapshot and then compare then project the image of the next state meanwhile the event is ongoing and again you're only seeing supposedly the projected the prediction of the static state if there's a match so as i said static state the static state comparator but contemplate what it is you're attempting to compare. These two invariant structures, dynamically changing, different ratios of energy, frequency, oscillation, et cetera, et cetera. How are you syncing these events up and matching these quantities? Hint, the two can never match. So how would this ever work for a dynamically changing event? The Bayesian framework has not even begun being dismantled by the reality of Gibson's events. I've discussed one Bayesian system involved that I thought might work, I could see, in the specification of form. This was why C. Michel and Adelson in Nature and Neuroscience in 1998, where prior, in the form of a mathematical constraint, was applied to velocity vector fields or flows. Up there, I'm showing, as usual, our velocity vector field, how it looks when we're driving. And the constraint was motion is slow and smooth. That was applied to these fields. And generally, they argued all perception is an optimal specification based on the application of these constraints on probabilistic estimates of these fields. So one example was this rotating rigid ellipse. Rotating at a slow enough speed, it's perceived as rigid, as a rigid ellipse. But note that its perimeter is all resolvable into velocity vectors. And there's a constraint violation. If the ellipse rotates too quickly, too fast, it is no longer rigid, but rather floppy, plastic, rubber, rubbery. I like to note that the Gibsonian cube, again, it's a set of flow fields. As the, as the uh, side rotates toward us, the, uh, you have an expanding flow field. You have a straight flow field along the frontal face, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, but the edges of the vertices would be sharp junction and discontinuities at these flows. In other words, these features are simply very ephemeral, defined as invariants over these flows. And that gave an index into why this might be. If you take a rotating wire edge cube and strobe it in phase or at an integral multiple of its phase, you get two different phenomena. The rotating wire cube, you know, has a symmetry period of four. It's carried or mapped onto itself four times in every full rotation of 360 degrees. If you strobe it in phase at an integral multiple for eight, 12 strobes for evolution, you'll see a rigid rotating cube. Strobed out of phase, five, nine, 13 strobes for revolution, you get the wobbly plastic, plastically deforming rubbery cube. Rigidity is gone. Those nice features of edges, vertices gone. The constraint violated, I would have said probably something like spatial symmetry implies temporal symmetry. You have a spatially symmetric cube and uh, it should therefore sort of emit regular pulses, shall we say, but it does not. That's being destroyed by the out of, out of phase arrhythmic cube or strobe. One would wonder then, why is form any less non-existent in the material field, just as color is non-existent, just the creation of the brain? Logically, you're forced to this. All these all of these things become creations of, of the mind, of the brain. But the mathematics in the uh, Bayesian case we're, we're describing there with Weiss, Simichel, and Eelson can only be a partial description of the concrete specification process. And this priors as constraints method is not at all the same as predictive processing. It does not look at look like this. It is not a comparison or a comparator or a matching process. It's not the creation of predictions as possible perceptions like coffee cups being stirred, etc., that were then projected downwards. That was not the same case at all. So its success cannot be invoked to support predictive processing as say it is friston there in that um, article being noted there free energy and illusions the corn sweet effect but purvis and lotto and this this is their other book 2011 why we see it, what we do redux they reject even the bayesian model for example, Weiss et al., based on constraints on velocity fields. Again, it is natural statistics based on our experience. One example, the flash lag effect. So here we have that blue line or the blue object moving in a certain motion. And then we present a flash precisely in line with that object. However, what we perceive at slow speed of that blue object is the flash lagging behind. And as, as the object speeds up with greater speed, it would lag even further behind. Why is that? Well, this is explained by frequency data or statistics that they, they looked at in depth and with, with respect to the occurrence of image speeds of objects in our environment. So imagine they're looking at all kinds of objects and what we perceive as objects moving at a certain range of, of velocity and speed beyond a certain range that we can't even see that either on either side is too slow or is too fast but so this frequency data analysis is exactly analogous to the brightness and color data we just looked at briefly the, that idea so the lag effect for different speeds is predicted by the relative rank of different image speeds in the overall environmental distribution. So, so um, 
you're going to see image speeds. The greater the image speed, the more the lag effect. And you're going to have a function that relates to that. Similarly, the velocity field models, a la Weiss et al., were based on what's called the aperture problem. In the aperture problem there, we have a grating moving horizontally to the right. But as it passes through the aperture, only that a downward motion of those lines is seen, downward and to the right. So the models that predicted this type of motion uh, required, uh, again, rather arbitrary constraints, like motion is slow and smooth, have some reasonability about them. But the problem is different apertures create different perceptions. A narrow slit aperture like the one there would get a different motion, motion yet. The triangular, different motion yet. So again, different apertures, different perceptions. Again, the only way to predict this naturally is natural statistics. And again, having said that, the Bayesian machinery becomes superfluous. Now, Purvis and Lotto note that Gibson's emphasis on invariant relationships of elements and images like our uh, moving cup, cups across the uh, gradient, texture gradient. This has a great deal of merit, to quote them. And they quote, the present argument that visual perceptions depend on trial and error interactions with the world, gathering statistics. Now they relate this heavily to successful action. I'm not going into that here, but they relate highly to Bergman's virtual action again that reflexively link images, reflexively, in other words, they're saying reflexively link images, we're using the word reflexively because it's automatic, automatic specification, not inference. And so the reflex, reflexively link images and sources bears some similarity to Gibson's idea of resonances. Now, what they would say in this invariant structure that I like to preach about they would say this structure is learned empirically, statistically, which is an interesting question because yes, clearly these laws are ultimately a function of a lot of examples. And you could call that statistically empirically, just like any law of these invariance laws is, is a, a law defined over all kinds of events or examples. So I would say there's an equivalence between Purvis and Lotto statistics and this law or set of laws that define these events. But an interesting, subtle question. I won't go into it here. Now back to the resonances. Remember Gibson, the brain is resonating to the invariance in the external event. That nice list of event invariance up there and directly specifying the event. There's no image in the brain. To quote Purvis and Lotto, resonance, concept borrowed from the sympathetic physical resonances of vibrating bodies. And though they note the, the relationship, they say Gibson and his direct perception is perceived now as somewhat mystical. And they see themselves as uh, disambiguating this a bit. So as to the underlying neural structure for this resonance, they vote for P. Provisolato, vote for neural nets. So just to say a few things about that. First, any neural net architecture must be able to withstand Lashley. As we saw in number 26, Lashley effectively cut any fixed, that is hardwired neural network in the brain into shreds. And yet behavior still remained. In other words, no neural net today could withstand Lashley's assaults, something that tends to be forgotten. Secondly, the giant elephant in Purvis and Lotto's room, there's no theory of the origin of the image of the external world. How do you get that coffee cup? out of that net 
Well, they say it's just a uh, subjective experience. Three, neural nets are abstract mathematics. They are not concrete, not the concrete resonance that Gibson and conscious perception require. And fourth, they are irrelevant to the scale of time. Scales of time. Those who have been watching this series know that I've argued the brain specifies the external field at a scale of time via the velocity of its chemical dynamics, that the underlying chemical flows, the velocity of the chemical flows the normally buzzing fly at our normal scale of time. Hundreds of wing beats seen as a blur. The shorthand for this chemical flows is the brain's energy state. Raise the energy state. It, the fly could be specified as a heron barely flapping its wings. Raise it yet more uh, as a uh, ensemble of electrons, a blurred ensemble of electrons, very tiny scale. Notice this is Bergson's model. The brain is a holographic wave, a modulated reconstructive wave passing through a holographic field. Up there we have a little model of holographic reconstruction. Frequency one is specifying or being passed through that holographic plate and I'm seeing a virtual image of a cube. If I modulate it to frequency two, I can see a a different source of that wave front, a, uh, a cup in this case. So we're modulating a reconstructive wave and the image, the specified image is right where it says it is, external, within the field. Now that requires some discussion of, of the nature of time, but uh, that's enough for, for what's going on here, for the origin of the image of the external world. Now, this scale cannot be simply a mathematical, mathematical constraint like that of Weiss at all. Motion is slow, slow and smooth. It is a concrete dynamical transformation, like revving up an AC motor higher. Concrete. And the brain is acting as a concrete modulated reconstructive wave. Again, take the rotating ellipse. Let's say it's rotating so fast it's seeming non-rigid, wobbly. If I raise the energy state, that wobbly ellipse will become rigid. This prediction. This transcends constraints, mathematical constraints, or mathematical statistics. Think about that. This is completely transcend. This is concrete raising of an energy state, like revving up an AC motor. This is beyond the mathematics. But buzzing flies, heron-like flies, electron cloud flies, plastically deforming cubes, rigid rotating cubes, these are all different qualities. Yes, different qualia. The problem is all of a piece. Scales of time, color, form, like cubes. And scale takes the problem of qualia to include color beyond bays or statistics or neural nets. Color is equally a function of specification, an optimal specification. The employment of, again, natural steam statistics or invariance. But mathematics does not account for color. In fact, color is held to be in the external field, not to be external fields. We started this whole thing with, and rather in some mental space, some strange undefinable mental space or perceptual space. At the root of this, is the classic metaphysic. This is all via the classic metaphysic of space and time, the fundamental basis of the mathematics in the first place. The transformation of the holographic field and the motion of objects, quote unquote, within the field, which are themselves only changes or transfers of state within this global transform motion or transformation. This transformation is indivisible but it is treated as infinitely divisible, thus as a series of instantaneous states, each with a time extent of a mathematical point. So as, as our heron-like fly flies, it's, it's partitioned into a set of instantaneous states, along with the whole rest of the universe, 
or cube of the all of space. And each cube is utterly homogeneous, stripped of all quality to include color, because the time extent of a mathematical point cannot allow for quality. The holographic field is intrinsically qualitative, spread out in time in the buzzing fly within one objective second, see, measured by our clock hand. We go from buzzing, wing beats 200 per second, as seen as a blur, to flapping its wings slowly like a heron, to a motionless fly where we're starting to see shimmering, crystalline oscillations of the fly as it is, or again motionless, but an ensemble of whirling, whirling electrons. All possible specifications, qualitative. Let's put out the color red, over again, one second of objective time measured by the clock hand. One second of red light, 400 billion wave oscillations of a electromagnetic field spread out in time such that we could count it, distinguish each event, each wave. It would take 25,000 years to count each wave. So each event, the red of the light, the buzzing of the fly is compressed by and in our perception, amazingly compressed. So to quote Bergson from Matter of Memory, may we not conceive, for instance, that the irre irreducibility of two perceived colors is due mainly to the narrow duration into which are contracted the billions of vibrations which they execute in one of our moments. If, if we could stretch out this duration, that is to say, live it at a slower rhythm, should we not, as the rhythm slowed down, see those colors pale and lengthen into successive impressions, still colored, no doubt, but nearer and nearer to the coincidence with to a coincidence with pure vibrations. In other words, nearer and nearer to a coincidence with the abstract space, the completely homogeneous cubes taken at the smallest conceivable instant of time, where all quality has been stripped, but never quite reaching this, because this is an ideal limit never reached. That's the key. It's never reached. So color would also be an optimal specification at a scale of time of vibrational properties of the field. Again, back to the holographic reconstruction up there on the right. We said we could modulate to reconstruct the wave from frequency one to frequency two, from specifying a cube to specifying a cup. But we could send a reconstructive wave, a composite, frequency one plus frequency two, not as coherent, and specify a fuzzed image of cube slash cup, which is veridical. Cube, cup, or cup cube. Only an omniscient observer, standing outside the whole process, who knew what frequency one was tied to and what frequency two was tied to, that is, as an original object wave would know. But we can't, we're not the omniscient observer. So it's a matter of how the reconstructive wave specifies the information in the field, just as how the reconstructive wave there is specifying the information in the holographic plate. And remember the field is four-dimensionally transforming, indivisible in 4D in extent. So there's much play to specify. So color is not in some mental space. Specified color, just like the specified buzzing fly or heron like fly with a wobbly cube is, is right where it says it is, external within the field. Landy, who wrote the paper, I mentioned initially, spend some time on this subject. Are Bayesian networks representational? Now he's not for Bayesian networks, so he's arguing against this. He argues that there are no representations in these networks, no more than a spring thermometer. They're just statistics, calculated machines, machines, particularly not what are called detachable representations, that is, as in images that could guide an action, such as when an image reaching out for that coffee machine with the coffee cup. 
The debate, however, is a symptom of the Gibsonian's failure to place Gibson within Bergson's framework, within his temporal metaphysic and holographic model. Because of this, they have no theory of the image of the external world. Gibson does not truly provide one, and this is the cause and core of why he's seen as mystical. Again, to quote Bergson, it's not how perception arises, but how it's limited. So this lack of the actual understanding of the origin of the image of the external world, therefore, of where images come from, or if there even are any, debilitates their entire approach to cognition, but particularly, particularly the thought images, memory, the memory of images, and voluntary action, images guiding memory, or, or the ideal, ideal motor theory of voluntary action. Perhaps someday, when they consider the metaphysic which Gibson truly dwells, someday. So next we'll see. Till then, signing off.